The problem here is that you have a ruling political class which doesn't give a thimble full of cold spit about any kind of limitation on its power, raw power. I'm not talking about legal power. I'm talking about raw power to make you do something at the point of a needle, at the point of a gun. They just don't care anymore because they have gotten away with what they've gotten away with so often that they have concluded that there is no pushback. No matter how much damage this banking system, this banking cartel does to this country, the Constitution can't deal with it because the people that are supposed to enforce the Constitution against it will look at, look at that and say, we can't solve this problem judicially. And we know Congress is not going to solve the problem. The president's not going to solve the problem. Why? Because they're stooges of the financial world. They do what the financial people tell them to do. They don't get elected if they don't. So we're now stuck with this thing. They created this damn thing in 1913, and now this is the incubus, which we can't get off our backs until it collapses. So you think of the, the, the levels here, the, the first level, the Federal Reserve. Well, that's just economics. It has some social implications, but it's economics through wealth transfer back and forth, okay? The next level, voting. Well, wait a minute. That's the legitimacy of the entire government. All the government, yeah. Okay, so we're going to go to a higher level. That's a little bit more important than economics, right? Because that may affect economics. And then we go to the next level, medical experimentation. Well, that's the life of people themselves, future generations. That's more important than voting or economics. So you see how far this has gone? And, and uh, obviously the Federal Reserve problem, that's from 1913, right? And of course, they've never touched that since then. Right? The voting thing, that was just last year. And of course, the medical one is, is with us now. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest with some distinction. This is Dr. Edwin Vieira, JD and PhD, who has argued constitutional cases up to and including the U.S. Supreme Court. He joins us this Thursday, August 19, 2021. Dr. Vieira, thank you for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Well, th thank you for having me again. We are often get requests from viewers to deal with subjects that I am in no way qualified and uh, really need to rely on people like yourself who have such deep experience in not only the history, the law, the constitutional law, and uh, the perspectives of what has happened in the past, what we know, and uh, what is possible uh, what is right and what is wrong about what's going on. You and I were just discussing before we got started about how every morning you wake up, you have really, uh, it's a big surprise these days what the world is that you're waking up into because so much changes overnight in terms of policies and laws and actions by by governments and so on. Uh, the landscape around us is shifting under our feet. But we wanted to talk with you about a big, big topic, which is starting from, I guess, the, the simple statement of do we own anything and there's many aspects to that, our, our money, our land, our homes, our businesses, our, our own bodies, our own thoughts. And this is coming to a crisis around us right now in our, in our lives. And uh, what are you seeing as some of the most blatant and pressing examples of uh, threats to our ownership of our own, of our own selves at, at this time? and help us understand some perspectives, some context around that so we can kind of get our heads back on straight because it seems like a lot of the official story we're being told is like, this is how we get back to normal. And it's like, this doesn't feel normal to most people. So uh, help, help give us some perspective on that. Well, I doubt that these people in uh, government officials, government official positions who are telling you that, oh, we'll get back to normal if you'll do this, that, and the other thing, have any intent upon getting back to normality as we used to understand it. I mean, they seem to have recognized that through uh, psychological manipulation, primarily fear, 
they can make large segments of the population do and maybe even believe anything they tell them to do or believe. You've seen this happen, right? So I don't think that they're going to give up uh, that um, competence which they now have developed. They're going to push it as far as they want to push it economically, politically, socially, culturally, whatever, in whatever way they think they want to uh, change the nature of American society. And in, in a sense, it all does come down to the concept of ownership, which is one of those really vague terms, because ownership talks really is directed to the concept of an individual's ability to control some thing. Let's try to narrow it down. Uh, it might be land. It might be money. It might be particular kinds of personal property. It might be himself or herself, his own body. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and you can kind of set up one of these Venn diagrams, and a big circle is all of the possible behaviors that could be called ownership. And then you can draw a few other circles that talk about limitations on ownership through, uh, let's say, as a classical example, uh, governmental regulation or control of some kind. So you look at the United States legal system. One may have ownership of a plot of land, but that particular plot of land may be subject to certain governmental powers, the power of taxation, for instance, the power of eminent domain, the power under some extraordinary circumstances of seizure, say the country were invaded and your property was on the front lines and the military would simply come in and say, well, we're setting up an artillery base here and that's the end of it, right? Your ownership has lapsed at that point in any one of those types of situations and to some degree. But those governmental powers are controlled, we supposedly believe, by constitutional principles generally of limitation. Public, uh, excuse me, private property cannot be taken for public use without the payment of just compensation. So we're talking about concepts of public use. That has to be defined in some specific way. We're talking about just compensation, and that usually amounts to one particular piece of property is going to be exchanged for another, typically money, right? eminent domain, they take certain land from you, and they have to pay you the fair market value in money. And so ownership actually is transferred from the property to the money. And then, of course, you come into the question, well, if they're regulating the monetary system through a systematic uh, uh, procedure of what people call inflation, right? Increasing the money supply, decreasing its purchasing power through uh, systematic operations in the, uh, the banking cartel, then what's happening there? Are you receiving just compensation when, in fact, they're undermining the purchasing power of that money as, just as they're handing it to you? So you get in all sorts of complicated situations. I think the one that's most fascinating right now, because it has potentially no limit, and I'll uh, compare this to the, the malicious situation, the draft situation, everyone in society uh, who's able-bodied at least uh, potentially has a duty to defend that society against let's say, invasion by foreign powers. We make it very simple. There's no, there's no moral question. We're invaded by foreign powers. Everyone has some level of constitutional duty to provide himself in a defensive mode for society. And that could lead to what? Your death. You're being maimed. You're being driven insane or whatever it is. So you would lose some aspect of the property even in your own body. But that would, again, be limita limited by constitutional principles and certain requirements that had to be met, and practical political requirements. What's going on since, or well, when? Since the middle of 2020, when they started talking about these vaccines, or so-called vaccines, for uh, COVID-19, or now the Delta variant, or the Epsilon variant, or whatever will be coming along tomorrow morning. They said, you can be required in some way or other, you can be coerced in some way or other, to take an experimental medical treatment. And I don't want to get into all of the vagaries of whether the, you know, this virus exists or how dangerous it is or whatever. They're saying you're required to take an experimental medical treatment, which everyone admits is experimental, because 
not only do they not know a lot about the immediate effects of these things, deleterious immediate effects of these things, but they certainly don't know anything about the long-term effects. The experiments even on animals haven't been done sufficiently. And they don't know anything about the intergenerational effects Mm -hmm. of these uh, treatments. And those questions are ones that a large number of highly credentialed scientists around the world are posing. So what do we have here? Well, we have the classic example of the violation of one's right to life and one's right to the property in his own person, not only his own person, perhaps future generations deriving from his own person. And what is the power of government to interfere with that property right? Well, the answer is, if you go back to the Nuremberg Code, it was derived, of course, from the experiments that certain Nazi doctors were performing on involuntary patients in concentration camps. You cannot require any individual to engage in an experimental medical procedure without informed consent. And those are the two clear words informed and consent, which means first you have to have sufficient information to rationally consent, and then you actually have to consent. You could say, even if I have sufficient information, I'm not going to consent. Even if you tell me that this thing is not as dangerous as I think it is, I may not consent because it's an experiment. But certainly I can't be required to consent if if I'm not given a sufficient amount of information, and at the present time, I think almost anyone who looks at this thing fairly would say the sufficient amount of information is not there. So we have come to the point at which now you can be made, according to our leadership group in Washington, you can be made an experimental animal. Period. End of discussion. So now you have lost your right of property in your own person, because the right of property in your own person is control of my own body. Mm -hmm. And has it been done with the constitutional requirement of due process of law? All right? All property deprivations have to meet some due process of law, and they're different depending on what the deprivation may be. Taxation is going to be different from eminent domain. But now we get into this question of medical experimentation. So they've thrown this thing entirely out the window. And there is never a justification for that, because by hypothesis, if one requires informed consent and the information is not there to make the consent, then it cannot possibly be due process of law to enforce the treatment. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a rational uh, lacuna there. And that's where we've come. So I think people have to look at this and say, wait a minute. The problem here is that you have a ruling political class which doesn't give a thimble full of cold spit about any kind of limitation on its power, raw power. I'm not talking about legal power. I'm talking about raw power to make you do something at the point of a needle, at the point of a gun. They just don't care anymore. Because they have gotten away with what they've gotten away with so often that they have concluded that there is no pushback. And especially we can expect that there will be no pushback if there isn't a radical change in the composition of the Congress in next year's election. I mean, we have this dispute going on, well, was there or wasn't there fraud and election in this state and that state and so forth and so on. It's pretty obvious that there, has, that there must have been, to some degree, if you simply look at what's going on in Arizona with these boards of election, one particular board of election is refusing to turn over documentation or computer records or whatever that the state senate in Arizona is demanding that they turn over. And usually you look at a situation like that and you say, well, if someone is spoliating evidence, that's a legal term, that is hiding particular evidence or destroying evidence or manufacturing evidence, fabricating evidence, forging evidence, whatever it is, that is usually itself evidence of the guilt of that party, the liability of that party. And it's especially fascinating in that particular case in Arizona, this is some low-level board of uh, elections that's refusing to do this. You know, in, in a sane society, those people would already be locked up. So I'll just go back to this point. We're going to, the next, next year is going to show 
whether this thing is uh, capable of, what shall I say, normal uh, control or not in the elections. Because I cannot possibly imagine what just what's happened this year so far, that there will not be a reaction, and a lot of Democrats will be removed, uh, at least from the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives might even change its composition from Democrat to Republican. Not necessarily that I'm you know, saying the Republicans are terribly much better, but you know, politically people will say we've had enough. All right? For whatever reason, we're going to put somebody else in there to see what happens. If that doesn't happen, if we have another election like the 2020 election where people are looking for the same way, but this doesn't add up, all sorts of anomalies here, then I would say, yes, we're in, we're in a very serious, extremely, situ- extremely serious situation. Because the normal check and balance on the excesses of public officials, when they become rogue, the normal check and balance is electoral change in the composition of legislatures, executive branch, governors, and so forth, president, whatever. And then that results in either new statutes being passed or perhaps prosecutions, investigations, prosecutions being undertaken, whatever. And the situation is, one would hope, cleared up. But we now have come to the point where we have a ruling political class that says we can do any damn thing we want, and apparently we can get ourselves elected by questionable means. (laughs) All right? So there's no control within the normal system. So you start talking about property rights, well, they're gone by hypothesis because whatever due process would be in a particular situation, the ruling political class has said we're not going to follow it. Or we're going to bring some lawyer out who will double talk, who will give you some verbal ledger domain, sleight of hand, to explain why what we're doing is perfectly legal. That's what they call you know, the, the court lawyer. Mm-hmm. The court lawyer would come forth to uh, explain why Henry VIII's execution of whichever one of his wives he was executing uh, was perfectly legal, right? Or to explain away whatever it was that the king was going to do. Give it some veneer of uh, justification. And really, that's where we've come right now. So that really brings you back to, brings me back at least, to, to the fundamental constitutional question here. Well, what within the system is capable of dealing with this problem. No. I mean, you, you look just at the, the, the uh, election situation, and I'm going to go back one step to the financial situation, and then one step ahead to this medical problem, the medical experimentation on the population. Okay. You look at the electoral situation 2020, and people were jumping up and saying, wait a minute, there was at least arguably fraud in mail-in ballots, absentee ballots, computer, you know, counting of the ballots, whatever. And what happened? Now, in in some cases, it was obvious that something serious had gone wrong. It's in Pennsylvania where they couldn't have absentee ballots or mail-in ballots. The Secretary of State, the court said, oh, yes, you can, even though the Constitution of the United States says, oh, no, the legislature determines that question. Mm -hmm. And the legislature had determined that question. The court simply said, no, we're not going to follow that. Well, so you had it right there. But that was a clear constitutional problem. And I don't know how many votes that impacted, but it could have been enough, theoretically, to change the outcome of the electoral votes from from Pennsylvania. So what happened? Well, what happened was the courts all looked the other way. There was not a single instance of a trial actually held where the facts were determined before a jury. Not a single one. And even the Texas uh, Texas, Texas versus Pennsylvania case in the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which was simply asking at the initial stage to have the Supreme Court take the case. It wasn't asking Mm -hmm. for a result coming out of the Supreme Court, but just to take the case. People said, oh, we're not going to look at this because you have no standing. Well, that's obviously nonsense. The Electoral College is a state institution. The states control the composition of the Electoral College. The Constitution says so. So if one state is saying that some other state Mm -hmm. was in one way or another falsifying, intentionally or accidentally, the electors that that state was sending to the Electoral College, that first state obviously had a claim against that behavior. Because the Electoral College is a state institution. Any state involved in it could raise a claim against misbehavior by some other state. We're not going to go look at that. Well, my God, that's the end of the process, isn't it? We're not going to look at it. 
So anything that happens there at that scale, and that's the ultimate scale, right? The election of the president through the Electoral College. No, the courts aren't going to look at that. Oh, my goodness. Well, okay. Why not? I don't know why not. They could have come up with a, uh, a ruling initially in that case that would have held everything in abeyance after January the 20th. In fact, I wrote, a, I wrote a long analysis of this for someone who was going to submit it somewhere. I don't know what the heck happened to it. was exactly how that could have been done. Now we have the problem that you have the Biden-Harris administration in there with everything they've done, all the people they've appointed, the various statutes that they're trying to pass and various ec- mm-hmm. uh, executive orders that Biden has already signed and so forth mm-hmm. and so on. What if two years from now, finally, some of this stuff that percolates up from Arizona and Pennsylvania and Michigan and so forth and so on, where these various people are trying to get audits of the voting and so forth, it finally percolates up. Well, oh, yes, there was a fraud here. Oh, yes, well, the Biden administration was actually not, Biden and Harris were not actually elected. Then what happens? Could you possibly reverse everything that has been done in, in, in two years or three years? Exactly how would that reversal take place? You'd have to have a thousand times more courts than you have now for all the litigation that come up mm-hmm. from the people who were harmed by all of those activities, all of which were illegal, mm-hmm. because Biden was not the president and Harris was not the vice president. So you see, by the Supreme Court doing what it did, it's made it essentially impossible now to come back and correct these problems. And I think maybe they were, they were thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, if we open that can of worms, this is exactly what will happen. And so we're going to run away from it. Now this is the same thing that happened with the banking system. You create the Federal Reserve System, this huge cartel. In 1933, a system was created for all the rest of industry. It didn't include the banks, which already had the Federal Reserve System. It was called the National Industrial Recovery Act, created by Roosevelt, one of the first major pieces of legislation that he got through in '33. And this cartelized every segment of American industry. So you had a steel cartel, you had a coal mining cartel, you had a cartel dealing with agriculture, various various kinds, and one was a, the uh, <laughs> poultry cartel. And these cartels set up codes which regulated production and prices and so forth and so on. They were kind of economic, little economic planning agencies. Exactly in principle what the Federal Reserve System does in the banking and currency field. Hmm. All right? There's really no difference. One dealt with steel and the other deals with money. All right, money and, and, and uh, credit. <clears throat> so th- this system comes to the Supreme Court uh, in a peculiar way. They had a live, po- what they called the live poultry code in New York. And this required that poultry dealers would sell chickens by the coop, and the coop had two chickens in it. And you could not, if you were a poultry dealer, you could not sell one chicken. <laughs> You had to sell both chickens. So the buyer could not come in and say, well, I don't like that particular chicken. Just sell me me the other one. No, no, he had to buy both of those. So it was like a triviality. How much did a chicken cost in New York in 1933? This case gets to the Supreme Court because there were criminal penalties involved in violating the code. And the Schechter brothers, who ran a poultry business, violated the code. And they were criminally charged. Gets all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. And, and the government looked at this and said, well, or the government argued and said, well, this is constitutional because all that's happened is Congress has given to these experts in the field, various fields, the business people who know how to run these businesses, they've given them the power essentially to do that. Right? And therefore, it's perfectly legitimate. And this is a good way to deal with the depression. Supreme Court looked at that and said, well, this is a delegation of legislative power to mm-hmm. these people. Mm-hmm. And they said, this delegation is, and I quote, unknown to our law, unquote. Univer- and they declared it unanimously unconstitutional. Mm. Right? Now, the same thing with the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is an even bigger delegation of authority because the poultry code de- dealt with poultry, the steel code dealt with steel, the coal code dealt with coal. So these were limited in their own little areas. The Federal Reserve System code authority, 
this cartel of banks deals with the entire system of money and credit within the United States, which affects everything in the economic life of people, right? Mm -hmm. Money is diffused throughout the economy. All transactions are stated mode, 99.999%. I suppose there are some barter transactions. But the vast majority of commercial transactions are stated in terms of money on one side and some good or service on the other, right? And <clears throat> credit through the banking system runs through the entire economic system. So the Federal Reserve System is the worst example of a code authority that you could possibly imagine. Why isn't it unconstitutional? Well, it's not unconstitutional because it wasn't part of the National Industrial Recovery Act. It had its own separate statute from 1913. And so it didn't come before the Supreme Court then. And subsequently, it has not come before the Supreme Court, and it will never come before the Supreme Court for the simple reason that the justices will look at this and say, my God, if we declare this thing unconstitutional in any way, shape, or form, what will be the consequences economically, socially, internationally? We'll throw a monkey wrench into this system. We cannot tell Congress what to do about it. Mm -hmm. We can only tell Congress what parts of it are no good. Congress, this great committee made up of people who can't agree that a man is a man or a woman is a woman, uh, this Congress will then be left holding an empty bag. They'll have to fill it in some way in a very short period of time because otherwise the markets are going to go crazy. Right? You have chaos, not only domestically but internationally. Therefore, we can't touch this. <sighs> and I would say that's in a, in a way that's the rational response. You know, if you can't correct the situation, you better keep your hands off, right? But that's the reason they'll never touch it. So no matter how much damage this banking system, this banking cartel does to this country, the Constitution can't deal with it because the people that are supposed to enforce the Constitution against it will look at, look at that and say, we can't solve this problem judicially. And we know Congress is not going to solve the problem. The president's not going to solve the problem. Why? Because they're stooges of the financial world. They do what the financial people tell them to do. They don't get elected if they don't. So we're now stuck with this thing. They created this damn thing in 1913, and now this is the incubus, which we can't get off our backs until it collapses. Now let's go to the next level here, which is the medical experiment level. We know from the aftermath of World War II and the Nuremberg Code that a basic principle, for which there should be, is no exception as far as I know, it shouldn't be in any event. You cannot require, coerce, or even require, without coercion, an individual to be the subject of medical experimentation unless that individual is given informed consent. The individual has to give con informed consent. Mm -hmm. Now, that has two aspects. One is the consent. He has to say yes or no. And the predicate for that consent has to be sufficient information, obviously, he can understand, that will allow him to make a rational decision. And even if he has all of the information that could possibly be assembled, he can still say no. Mm -hmm. right? He has to be, but clearly, if he isn't informed, then he's incapable of giving consent. Right? This is the whole situation that you have with little children. Little children are incapable of giving certain kinds of consent because they don't have the information function in their brains yet to be able to, as it were, parse the, the uh, material that's given to them, be able to think about it rationally. Mm -hmm. All right, so what do we have here? We have a medical treatments. They call these vaccines, but they're really not, technically speaking. We have mm -hmm. these medical treatments that all sorts of highly credentialed scientists throughout the world are warning have really deleterious effects which we don't entirely understand. We're seeing some of these develop. They're connecting to the vaccines. It's not entirely clear what the connection is and how extensive this may be. It may happen to some people you know, an hour after they take the vaccine. It may happen to some people six months later. It may happen to people two years later. We don't know. And one thing we certainly don't know is we don't know what the intergenerational effects of these vaccines may be. The one that comes to mind is some scientists saying, well, when a woman is pregnant and she gets, takes one of these vaccines, it may not affect her. She may not die. She may not become terribly uh, ill. But if she has a female child, unborn child, 
that female child may be sterilized, which means that this child, when the child gets to be 16, 18, 20 years old, will discover, wait a minute, I can't have any children. Mm -hmm. All right, well, now that affects, that's the next generation. That's your intergenerational effect. And then, of course, that person, right, we don't know what the effect will be because that person maybe hasn't even been born yet, let alone hasn't reached the age at which, you know, she would potentially give birth to children. So we don't know any of this. It's, an, it's not only unknown at this point, it's unknowable at this point, from which it would follow that you can't conceivably require someone to take these treatments. Uh, end of discussion. And that would be whether you did it directly by the government coming in and saying, well, we're going to require this of military personnel or we're going to require this of our employees. Mm -hmm. And they can't do it by proxy, by saying, oh, well, we'll write some uh, gibberish, legal gibberish coming out of the Department of Justice that says employers can require this, private employers can require this, private schools can require this, whatever. So we'll do it by proxy. They can't do it either way. And there's an old constitutional doctrine. I don't know when this thing first started, but it's a long time ago, at least in the 1960s. Uh, it comes to the fore, called, called the unconstitutional, doc unconstitutional conditions doctrine. Government cannot make it con a condition of the receipt of any public benefit or the immunity from any public harm on the other side, but the receipt of any pu public benefit. Uh, that the individual has to surrender some constitutional right in order to receive that benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's as trivial as something like uh, uh, welfare payments which, to which you're not entitled, right, unless it's a statute, driver's licenses. I mean, look at these cases in which they, they, they applied this. And so one would think, number one, that that would apply to one's own life, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot condition the uh, the uh, the threat to one's own life uh, you can't you can't condition something like employment on a person uh, taking a medical treatment that could threaten his own life uh, that would be that would, I mean, like that would be first year law school uh, type uh, understanding of this but what's going to happen there well uh, no, it looks like nothing right? and this raises the same problem as with the Federal Reserve System and as with the election system in the judiciary, which I mentioned, there's, imagine what kind of a case would have to come to the Supreme Court, serious case on this medical experimentation problem. One of the things the court would have to be, would be before the court, and the court would have to decide was, well, was this uh, whole process illegal because there wasn't informed consent? Mm -hmm. And there wasn't informed consent, and that led to all sorts of people being harmed. You know, it's not just going to be a question of injunctions. Well, I, I don't want to get the shot. It's, it's going to be, well, I've gotten the shot, and this happened to me. Now what will the court be faced with? Will it be faced with going back and saying, well, from the very beginning, these uh, government public health people were not being entirely candid with the public. Maybe they didn't know, and that was through recklessness or willful blindness, or maybe they lied. They did know, but they lied because they had some ulterior motive. And as a result of this, some innumerable number of people have been harmed. They've been killed, or they've been maimed, or whatever it is that has happened to them. And now we're going to open up this huge can of worms of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of potential lawsuits because of these medical experiments that were imposed. Now, do you think that this court, the court we have now, that didn't have the gumption when they still had the time to look into election fraud in a few different states, is going to take that kind of action later on? Hmm. A year from now, two years from now, when it's discovered, oh, yeah, that these things have, have seriously harmed hundreds of thousands of people as a result of public officials and private employers imposing, right, making these things a condition of the receipt of some governmental benefits or the condition of private employment or whatever, or condition of going to school, whatever it was. You think that that Supreme Court is going to take that action? Of course not. They're going to run away from it the way a vampire runs away from garlic. 
So this is another fait accompli. You had the fait accompli of the Federal Reserve System in 1913-33, that combination, which has now, now holding our entire economy, maybe the world's economy, hostage mm -hmm. because it's a faulty system. Right? You had the, this electoral determination that the Supreme Court made the 2020 in the 2020 election uh, brouhaha, which for all intents and purposes I think is going to foreclose the possibility of judicial intervention into elections in the future. Certainly on any large scale, maybe there'll be you no know, kind of local election or whatever, but certainly on any large scale, which opens up the floodgate to electoral fraud to the extent it wasn't opened up before. But mm -hmm, I mean, really mm -hmm. now, because the fraudsters know the courts are not going to look into it. Yep. And now we have this medical experimentation, that this Mengele procedure that's going on, Dr. Mengele procedure, which is going on, which I can, I would lay any amount of Krugerrands down on the table that you will never have a Supreme Court decision that really looks into what happened here because of the horrendous consequences. I mean, if you look at what happened after World War II. They discovered the Nazi doctors, what were they? I don't know, there maybe 20 of them. I don't know, there's a small number of people who have been conducting these uh, rather horrendous experiments on involuntary patients. And they said, okay, well, you have to pay the penalty, which is death for those people. They were hanged, right? This that was the penalty. I don't know whether all of them were hanged. Uh, Mengele escaped, right? <clears throat> but it was taken extraordinarily seriously. Now, that was a very small number of people. And they were not doing experiments on the entire population of Germany. Uh, what they were doing was horrific enough, but it was a very small number of people that they were exposing to these experiments. Here we have a public health bureaucracy and the politicians behind them who are exposing the entire population of the United States to these medical experiments. And not only the entire population living now, but the entire population that may derive from the ones living now. If these uh, medical treatments, as many scientists say, will have intergenerational effects. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you look at that, and I look at those three, and I say, well, now there has been a fundamental breakdown here. Because in the first place, the, the politicians failed. The elected politicians. They didn't control the bureaucracy or haven't controlled the bureaucracy in the present case. They're not controlling the medical bureaucracy, the public health bureaucracy. In the case of the Federal Reserve System, they're not controlling that bureaucracy. And clearly, in the case of the electoral fraud, potential electoral fraud, whatever you want to put it, uh, the political figures w may be involved in it, uh, as opposed to not controlling it. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Uh, those political figures, the el these elected officials, they haven't done anything. And then number two, what about the court system? Well, the court system is thrown up and says, we're not going to do anything. They're, they're quite blatant about it. Right? We're not going to do anything about this. And then we come to the third pillar, if you will, which is the voters. Well, I don't know the extent to which the voters are actually going to do something, but I certainly worry that if electoral fraud won't be touched by the politicians or the courts, that electoral fraud will continue to operate on a very large scale, which means the voters become irrelevant. Or at least they don't control the situation anymore. Somebody else does. Okay, Computer companies or whatever controls it. Well, now you look at the constitutional structure, and you say, well, let's remove the voters, let's remove the courts, let's remove the politicians or the public officials. Let's remove all of those from control of this situation so that some shadowy figures in the background are actually controlling. We don't know who they are. Uh, if they're in regulatory agencies, they're in the, you know, the Federal Reserve System or what have you. Well, we, we, we know the locus of this thing, but we don't necessarily know the individuals or what, what their actual goals are. Well, at that stage, we go back to this initial question. Do you really have any property in anything anymore? Do you have any things, including your own body, that you can say, to some extent, you have absolute control over? Right? Remember the Venn diagram. You're going to have a big circle of all the behaviors in which one could engage with, a, with respect to a certain type of property, land or money or personal property or himself, his, his individual body. And then you cut out of that big circle by putting a few smaller circles touching it on the circumference, the kinds of regulation that would be justified constitutionally. And all of those things don't entirely eat up the big circle, 
because they are limited. They themselves are limited by constitutional constraints. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the, the one, I suppose everybody knows, is eminent domain. You can take property for public use, but there has to be just, just compensation. compensation in fair market in terms of fair market value. Right? We have all those. Well, as soon as you knock that out, and they knock that one out, there's a good example of it. Where they say, well, it doesn't necessarily have to be for public use. It could just be for public good. Which is a, you know, this interesting lawyer's distinction here. That was the case of taking property from a particular individual to give to another individual because, or a group of individuals, corporation, I guess, because they would set up a shopping center which would generate more revenue for the community. Uh, my particular piece of property isn't generating uh, sufficient tax revenue in somebody's estimation, and therefore they're going to take it from me and give it to Corporation X, because Corporation X will set up a shopping center, and that will generate more tax revenue. All right? Now, this wasn't for public use, because the use was by the corporation. But it was for the public good because they could get to squander more money. All right? Well, that's the kind of lawyer double talk that has consistently undermined and undermined and undermined the constitutional limitations. And the reason the lawyers get away with that ultimately is well because people will accept it. Right? It's intergenerational. They'll do a little bit to your grandfather, and then they'll do a little bit to your father, and by the time it gets to you, it's been so undercut that it really has no significance anymore, real-world significance. It's all a matter of lawyer arguments and double talk. And this comes back to the point of who really runs any particular society. <laughs> and it is not those figures in public office. They, are, you know, they talk about public servants. I mean, theoretically, that's what they're doing. They're serving the public. It's the vast majority of people, the people, we the people, all right? And if they don't take a particular interest in actually controlling the behavior of the public institutions and the individuals who are serving in office, then, as we know, right, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely and you will tend over time to get the worst possible personalities coming to the fore to be in public office because they see that they can misuse those offices <clears throat> to their own benefit might be financial benefit might be just narcissism right they have they have uh, they're on power trips all the time psychopaths and that's exactly what we see now it has gotten to the point where the people at the highest level in office blatantly tell us, Biden the other day, <clears throat> you had Walensky, who's the head of the CDC, uh, continuing the moratorium on the payment of rent mm -hmm. to landlords. Now, that's a property interest, isn't it? Yep. If I'm a landlord, if I own that particular piece of property, I enter into a contract, which is also property, the terms of that contract, benefits of that contract of property, by which I make this property, the landed property, available to certain individuals, and they provide me with another kind of property in exchange called money. All right? That's the deal. So we're talking about rights of property, we're talking about rights of contract, fundamental constitutional principles. And you would say, well, now how can these be in some way abrogated? Well... Normally speaking, when property rights of that kind are abrogated, somebody goes to a court and says, I have a legal right not to pay my rent, or the landlord says, I have a legal right to, to evict these people, or whatever it may be. But a court makes that kind of decision, according to existing statutes and earlier, earlier precedents, court decisions. Now we had Walensky, I think that's her name, the head of the CDC, saying, well, I'm going to continue this rent moratorium, notwithstanding the Supreme Court indicated very recently that this rent type of rent moratorium is illegal, unconstitutional, obviously unconstitutional. And then what does Biden say? Well, the constitutional scholars mostly have said it's, uh, you know, it, it's unconstitutional, but we're going to go ahead with it anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, there you have it. All right? Why? Because he could, he said, well, there are a few, there are a few who think this may be valid. All right? So we're back to, back to the court lawyers. We're going to you know, pick and choose. Oh, this lawyer over here you know, from the Fenster's law firm, Fenster will tell us, will give us some reasoning, fault, faulty reasoning, why we can continue with this, and to hell with the rest of you people. In fact, to hell not with simply the rest of you people, but to hell with the Supreme Court of the United States, which made it very clear that this type of thing that we're trying to do is unconstitutional. And what we will do is 
we'll continue this until some new court case gets to the Supreme Court of the United States. And how will that happen? Well, it'll have to go into the U.S. District Court, and it'll be there for some length of time, and then uh, someone will lose and someone will win, but there'll be an appeal. It has to be an appeal to get to the Supreme Court. It will go to a circuit court, which is the next level, and it will spend you know a year, a year and a half there, percolating all the way up. And then after that, whoever loses will take it to the Supreme Court, and you're going to have another year or two years. All right, so you might be talking about three, four, five years while this illegality is going on. And it's going on all over the country, remember, mm-hmm. right? Because it's a generalized moratorium. And the spirit of that now, statement seemed to be of the, of the nature of we're going to do this until someone makes us stop. And you're saying... <laughs> and that would be the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. Right? Because if you go into the district court, and the district court grants an injunction against application of this, somebody's going to appeal. The government will appeal, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they have the right of appeal. They can go to the circuit court, and then whoever wins the circuit court will go to the Supreme Court. The, the ultimate authority against these people must be the Supreme Court of the United States, because they've already told the Supreme Court of the United States that they're not going to listen to them. Mm-hmm. So they're certainly not going to listen to a district court. They're not going to listen to a circuit court. They're going to have to listen to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court will come out with some decision, and then if they don't follow that decision, the Supreme Court will come after them with some kind of contempt order or whatever. But I'm, what I'm saying is this is a very long period of time. And during that long period of time, how many of these landlords might be driven out of business? Exactly. Their property sold to some bank that's willing, or to, you know, some Chinese investor that's willing to sit on it for two years. Another because example he has of some other idea. Yeah, and another then, example at the, at of businesses of all of that, destroyed at by the these end of policies. All of that, we're back in the same position as we were with the Federal Reserve, with the medical experiments, right? With the voter fraud. When that case gets to the Supreme Court, what are they going to say? Oh, let's get into this and open up a floodgate of litigation dealing with the thousands of properties throughout the country that have been subject to this. Or are we going to deny certiorari and refuse to hear it? You see the game that's being played here? Yeah, well, the the outcome seems to be the same, and that's complete abandonment of rule of law, abandonment of constitutionality. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, it is primarily because once these things get in and someone doesn't take immediate action, they have, I won't say unintended consequences, but I think in many instances they are intended, the consequences, mm-hmm. but they have these consequences which continue to build up and build up and build up until finally somebody gets the notion to take this to the judicial system, and they do. And then it's too late, mm-hmm. and the judicial system won't pass on it. <clears throat> we'll give you some kind of double talk the way they did with the, the election case, Texas versus whatever, Texas versus Pennsylvania, I guess it was. Right. And so the system breaks down that way. Now, who is supposed to be initially guarding this? Well, it's the politicians, number one, because they're not supposed to pass this kind of legislation. Right. They shouldn't have passed the Federal Reserve System. Right. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't have gone along with, well, I, I guess maybe they... They haven't passed legislation. Maybe they need to pass legislation to control uh, the medical bureaucracy, the public health bureaucracy. Uh, but they don't do it, or they've only done it in some locations. Right? Or, in the case of the electoral fraud charges, well, that was something that the court should have stepped in right away. Right? Because you know that if you let that go beyond, let's say, the inauguration for dealing with the presidential election. If you go beyond the inauguration, then there will be all sorts of consequences following from the existence of that new administration, which you probably cannot correct, or at least cannot correct very easily in the future. So you need to do this right away, right? Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. You've got to be watching these things and stop them, as it were, in the egg, right, before the serpent breaks out, Mm -hmm. before the serpent gets out of the egg. And who was supposed to do that ultimately? Well, that's the people themselves. They're the ones that are supposed to be looking over the shoulders of the politicians, the judges, the bureaucrats, and so forth and so on. And they haven't done that. And then, of course, that gets you back to the educational system. Uh, the fact that one of the things that isn't taught anymore is what used to, I guess, used to be called civics. Mm-hmm. or maybe political science if you were at high school or college level and so forth, which focused on the form of government with constitutional limitations on power, the role of the various branches and the people, and this, et cetera, et cetera. So people understood that what their not only role was, but what their responsibility is. These things don't happen in a vacuum. 
You don't have massive electoral fraud, for instance, in a vacuum. That goes on because people are just look, looking the other way. A manifestation probably of the general disinterest in in uh, politics because you have such a relatively small proportion of the actual electorate coming out for any particular election. Right? Not like the Stalin elections where 99% of the population voted, supposedly, right? Here we have a small, and that was a you know, totalitarian system. Mm-hmm. Here we have what is supposedly a system based upon individual rights, Declaration of Independence concept, right, where the people control not only the, the form of government, but the existence of the bloody government. And one aspect of control, once a government has been set up, is voting. And people, well, that's okay. So okay. You know, do whatever you want to do. And then when the courts say we're not going to look at it, there is no revolt of the masses, if I may you know, use that terminology. People aren't out in the streets. The gilets jaunes haven't appeared to say we're not going to stand for the courts refusing to look into this. Mm-hmm. That's what I find fascinating. Right? The Supreme Court says we're not even going... And, you know, that was a, an interesting point because all that Texas was asking for at the beginning yeah. was for the Supreme Court to take the case in its original jurisdiction because the Supreme Court makes this claim that they don't have to take original jurisdiction cases. Uh, they can just refuse to take it. So th- that was like the initial, the knocking on the door. It wasn't a determination of what the final result would be. It wasn't even a determination of, of some intermediate result that didn't get to the facts. I mean, there might have been some other reason that the court would have said, well, yes, we can hear this case, but we decide that you, know, you don't, really don't have a right to do this out of the other thing or to you know, get a final determination. Or they could have gone all the way and appointed a special master and found what the facts were and so forth and so on and then maybe made their own determination. Uh, but they didn't do that. And there was, a, there was a, as far as I was concerned, there was a death knell of the whole system. Because if the court won't investigate the legitimacy of the election of the President of the United States, specifically provided for in the Constitution of the United States, then what does the whole electoral system mean anymore? Mm-hmm. Especially when you have, look at this, this is not the presidential powers as they were understood by George Washington. Right? These are the presidential powers as they were understood by Franklin Roosevelt, taken to the second or third power now. Right? Presidents can claim they can do anything by executive order. Mm-hmm. They have these huge bureaucracies to which they simply farm out generalized policies in the bureaucracy. I mean, it's a, you look at the example of, of, of Fauci with Trump. Mm-hmm. Right? Fauci's the bureaucrat, Trump is the president. And Fauci is making all sorts of statements and determinations, and Trump is never saying, well, wait a minute, on what basis are you doing that? What real authority do you have here? Are there dissenting points of view, or at least different points of view? I give the example of when Trump uh, said he was taking hydroxychloroquine. Remember that whole sequence? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The FDA comes and says, oh, no, you can't. hydroxychloroquine shouldn't be uh, prescribed by this ivermectin, or any of these alternatives, corticosteroids, etc. These things shouldn't be prescribed. Right? Which, of course, led to the deaths of all sorts of people. Mm-hmm. We know that. Right? But in any event, Trump somehow was taking hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic, mm-hmm. which is, I guess, the way it's prescribed, primarily, as a prophylactic. And behind him is standing the uniformed uh, naval officer, who I guess was the Surgeon General at the time. Uh, So Trump is saying this, and I can't believe that Trump decided to do that on his own. He got some advice from one of the doctors around him, and then one of those doctors prescribed this to him, and there's certain kind of medical ethics, right? You don't just let the the patient go and pull something off the shelf in the pharmacy, right? Mm -hmm. You prescribe this. So he had been... He had been evaluated. The doctor said this was the appropriate treatment at this time. Here's the prescription. Here's the drug. He's taken the drug. Right? And he makes that statement. And Fauci is standing right next to him on the podium. And Fauci says, well, this is just anecdotal. And then Fauci gets to the microphone and starts talking about something else. Now, if I had been the president of the United States at that point in time, I would have grabbed Fauci by the collar and the, and the seat of his pants and thrown him off the podium. I said, what do you think you're doing interfering in the doctor-patient relationship? Mm-hmm. Right? Not only of me, because you're trying to make me look like a fool here, and the man standing behind me, Admiral so-and-so, I mean, he was an admiral, I think. But you're, you're communicating to all of the doctors in this country, with, also with threats and limitations mm-hmm. that are made by the FDA and made mm-hmm. by the, you know, the local uh, licensing boards, right. not to do this. 
You're interfering with a doctor-patient relationship of all of these people, which could result in their deaths. Who do you think you are? Did he do that? No. I don't know why he didn't do it, but I can understand why a lot of presidents will, will defer mechanically to these bureaucrats because they want whatever result the bureaucrat is going to put in. I don't know that Trump wanted that result. I don't think he was really smart enough to understand what was going on. But I think anyone who had the least understanding of presidential power in that situation would have done, well, maybe he wouldn't have done what I suggested because that was a little bit extreme. But he at least would have said something to Fauci, and Fauci would have been out, out of office the next day. Or at least they would have started the wheels grinding to remove him from office the next day. Mm-hmm. And so you see, the voting doesn't count because it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter what you may want. Somebody else is going to determine this in the back room. But even, even if and I was say Trump, but even if you were to get Trump in, the, the people wanted Trump. Here's Trump, and what is he? What happens? He's buffaloed by some bureaucrat. He's the president of the United States, who has the constitutional responsibility and authority to take care of the laws, be faithfully executed. That's about as high a responsibility as you can imagine you could have in public office. You are the one person, personally, who has this duty to take care that the laws, all of them, including the Constitution of the United States, be faithfully executed. And yet you let this fellow demean you in public in this way when the lives and, and health of so many other people out there may be involved? I mean, that's the kind of like microcosmic failure that I look at and I, I, I just kind of have to shake my head. Right on national television, mm-hmm. if you look at that, and there it was. There was a failure of the constitutional system right in front of your eyes in this one little incident. And this goes back, to, of course, to the technocratic point, which is, you know, people say, well, will I have property? Who's the one Schwab said? You won't have any, you won't have any property and you'll like it. That's the way he put it. You'll own you'll nothing no and you'll be happy. Like yeah, Klaus Schwab, yeah. Yeah, you'll be happy, right? We're going to have digital currencies, which will be controlled by the banking elite, these nameless, faithless people in, in uh, wherever they are, Basel. Right? They're going to control these things. We're going to have medical controls over you. We'll, we'll inject you or infuse you or whatever it is anytime we want. You won't have people to control you over, but you'll be happy about that. We're going to have control over, over where you live, how you live. Right, because we've got a climate problem, right? Climate emergency, so you can't have cars, and you're all going to live in, in uh, uh, these uh, high-rise buildings, et cetera, et cetera, all packed in, in, into the city because that's the easiest way to deal with it. We're going to do all these things to you, okay? and you will have no, essentially no say. And there was a microcosmic example of it because the average person, I think, realizes he doesn't have a lot of ultimate control over his property, in the big sense of that term. If he's a constitutional uh, scholar of some sort, he says, well, yeah, there are constitutional limitations on your rights of property. But at least in theory, there are limitations on what the government can do. But I think Mm -hmm. the average person today thinks, well, really there are no limitations. They can do any damn thing they want to me. And so here was the example. As I say, Mm microcosmically, there was the the one man in the United States who has this Constitution, highest constitutional authority there is. Excellent. To take care of the law. Take, I mean, think of that language. You're supposed to do whatever it takes mm-hmm. to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Think of how broad that power is. And here he was, uh, essentially being treated like a child, like an errant child, idiot, you know, idiot child, by this bureaucrat. And nothing happened. He didn't even make a joke about it. Trump, you know, Trump often did. He didn't even make a joke about it. it. It happened. And I think anyone looking at that who had some kind of understanding of the, the way this country has been, uh, how shall I say, colonized by technocrats. And that's what it comes back to. You know, the, the, the technocratic control. Property was to leave in the hands of the average person control over things and various kinds of human interactions, contracts, and so forth and so on. And the technocrats, going way back to the turn of the 20th century, said, this is a nonsensical system because the average person is really adult. He doesn't know what the heck he's doing. 
And society has become complex. We're not all living on farms in Iowa, self-sufficient little farms in Iowa. Society has become very complex. <clears throat> and we need the people who have expertise, scientific, mm -hmm. technological expertise, <clears throat> to be in control and to make decisions. And, and to accomplish that, we have to uh, subtly rearrange relationships here. Uh, people will vote, and that's fine. They're going to vote for politicians, put them into Congress, and that's fine, uh, because they're going to vote for the kind of politicians we want in Congress. And those politicians will create executive agencies, administrative agencies, as they call them, staffed with whom? Staffed with our people. And we will be given all sorts of very general powers to control all aspects of society, which we will do through the application of our technical expertise. Right? And this is what people like Patrick Wood, look him up, he's got a lot of interesting stuff, called the technocracy. Right? The control, the political control by the technocrats. Right? Mm -hmm. And this was understood in the 1930s. I mean, this was a, the, 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 the little think tank around Roosevelt was full of these people. Mm -hmm. And that was what the administrative agencies were set up to do. And that's what they've been doing and expanding their powers over and over again every year. Because most of those powers are, number one, extremely general, the way the statutes are written. Number two, they're based upon technical expertise, supposedly scientific expertise, which most people uh, are incapable really of judging. Uh, number three, uh, the courts early on in the 1930s came up with a theory of deference. Oh, if an administrative agency does this, you know, they're doing it as a result of the ex exercise of technical expertise, which we judges don't have. And therefore, unless they're doing something which is obviously, beyond doubt, in violation of the statute, we have to defer to what they've done. So in essence, they become not only the recipients of statutory authority, but they become the interpreters of their own statutory authority. And they do this in many areas where the interpretation, or the judging of the interpretation, requires a high level of scientific or technical expertise, and so they can mumbo-jumbo us around. So we have two levels of mumbo-jumbo. We have the mumbo-jumbo of the lawyers, whom we've always had, and then we have the mumbo-jumbo of the technocrats, which is added to this, and it becomes an impenetrable barrier of mumbo-jumbo. And so now they are removed from any real constitutional constraints, because as soon as you get into the constitutional constraint argument, they come back with the mumbo-jumbo. Well, what does due process actually mean when we're talking about uh, epidemiology, right, and virology, and on and on we go? Well, it doesn't mean anything, huh? because they become the interpreters of what due process must mean. Hmm. And this is a fascinating thing because there is another constitutional doctrine called the constitutional doctrine of <clears throat> it's called the doctrine of constitutional fact. <clears throat> and this arose primarily in areas where rates were being set. So you might have a, a rate for a uh, gas company, how much they could charge their customers, rate for an electric company, rate for a street railway, what could the fares be, so forth and so on. Okay. Public utilities. Mm -hmm were the ones that were generally concerned with rate setting. And so the public utility or company that was hired to do this, to, to provide gas, might be a monopoly, but it would be a private company, there would be a regulatory agency which would come in and set the rates. Or sometimes it was the legislature itself which would set a rate if it was a statewide thing. And these agencies or rate setters claimed that their rates were beyond review because the company would come forward and say, wait a minute, we're being deprived of property. Our property is actually being confiscated. We can't provide electric service. We can't provide street railway service or whatever it was at these rates. These rates are actually confiscatory of our property. And the agencies would argue, well, we're the ones who are experts. Don't tell us about that. Too bad for you. We've decided that that's what's going to go. Well, it goes to the courts, and the Supreme Court in a number of cases said, wait a minute. What we're dealing with here is a deprivation of property, which is a constitutional right. And we're doing this on the basis of some determination of fact as to whether a particular rate in this case is confiscatory of property, in which case it's unconstitutional, or not, in which case it's 
It's legal. And that constitutional question, because it is a constitutional question, has to be decided in the final instance by the judiciary, not by by some bureaucracy Mm -hmm. or even by a legislature. Legislatures can't take property without due process of law either. It was a constitutional issue that had to be decided. So if if you looked at the the, uh, system of the Federal Reserve, whether the Federal Reserve system is exercising delegated authority beyond our law, as was said in the uh, 1933 case, the industrial right. uh, code case. Yeah. Well, that would be a constitutional question. You can't dodge that simply because that's what the Federal Reserve says is the right thing to do. If you go to the electoral system, you can't dodge the, the constitutional question of whether the absentee ballots or mail-in ballots are valid because some bureaucrat or lower level, or even Secretary of State of the uh, particular state says that they are. If you go to the medical treatment area, you can't dodge the question of this, whether this is informed consent because there's no information or there's insufficient information or the information that's given is scientifically questionable. Right? That's a judicial question because it depends uh, because a constitutional right, the right to life ultimately, depends upon that. And what do we see in, in, in those areas? The courts have essentially shut the door, so we're not going to look at this. Mm-hmm. All right, and we're and we're going to fall, fall back on technocratic expertise, whether it's banking expertise, whether it's these boards of election, or whether it's the medical public health bureaucracy. So you think of the 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 levels here. The, the first level, the Federal Reserve. Well, that's just economics. It has some social implications, but it's economics through wealth transfer back and forth. Okay. The next level, voting. Well, wait a minute. That's the legitimacy of the entire government. All the government. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go to a higher level. That's a little bit more important than economics, right? Because that may affect economics. And then we go to the next level, medical experimentation. Well, that's the life of people themselves, future generations. That's more important than voting or economics. So you see how far this has gone? And and, uh, obviously the Federal Reserve problem, that's from 1913, right? And, of course, they've never touched that since then. The voting thing, that was just last year. And, of course, the medical one is is with us now. Mm -hmm. And there apparently is no solution being proposed to any of these. We just have to muddle through. We just have to hope that maybe, take the vaccines, for instance, that these things are not as detrimental as many very, very competent scientists say they are, or may be. We just have to hope that. Now, the unfortunate thing there is there's no antidote. You take the shot, and it has these long-term effects on you. Too bad for you. There's no way to go back from that. Uh, The electoral process, well, maybe there is. Maybe you could pass some kinds of statutes that would impose strict controls on anything other than in-person voting. Although, whenever a state attempts to do that, Georgia mm-hmm. being the example, uh, Democrats in this particular case come up and say, well, you can't do that because it's racist. Mm-hmm. All right? It's not racist to require everyone to have a driver's license, right? but it's racist to have anyone required to have a, a, some kind of ID for voting. Uh, but then at the economic level, you have the, the problem that we are stuck with these people. I mean, how could you imagine overturning the Federal Reserve System just economically, forget the court getting involved in it, but changing that system I mean, people talk about Bitcoin and other kinds of private, uh, you know, digital currencies. I don't think so. I think as soon as they get, they become significant, the uh, tax people will come in and make a hash of that because of the reporting requirements. They'll they'll make people uh, undergo for the use of those. And of course, if the banks set up their own digital currency on the huge scale on which they already operate, well, won't people be driven to that or go to that simply because of the convenience aspect of it? what they perceive as the convenience aspect of it. I would think that would probably be the way that the thing would uh, evolve, if you or devolve, if you will. So you look at all of these, and I, I look at them from a constitutional perspective, and I say, my God, there are constitutional solutions to this, because we do know what these limitations are and how they should be enforced. But the question is, who is going to bell the cat? All right? And I, I, I just shrug my shoulders. I have seen no one, and I mean no one, come out with a solution to this at any level. 
Now, it may be that the medical one will do it because if enough people uh, suffer adverse effects, mm -hmm. we have enough problems with this, not only from the, the medical treatment that's being imposed on people, but from the masking, from the lockdowns, and so forth. So you have all these ancillary effects. Mm -hmm. There may be just a revolt of the masses. They'll say, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. All right, and that may stop the worst of the uh, t you know, medical technocracy from imposing its views. But I always look at this and say, wait a minute, it, it's not enough to stop this from happening in the future, limit right. it from happening. Right. You've got to punish the people who did it in the past. You've got to have examples made of these people. Right? Deterrence is the key to stopping this in the future. Isn't that the whole theory of you know, uh, crime and punishment? Mm -hmm. We can't catch all the criminals, but the ones we do catch, we punish in such a way that people who are thinking about committing those crimes are to Deter a large extent deterred. deterred. Don't deter right. them all, but you'll deter enough of them so that it will have a beneficial effect. Well, here we have these huge, I don't know if I call them crimes, uh, kind of unnatural political events, unconstitutional political events. At some point, isn't someone going to have to be punished for this? Otherwise, what will the deterrent effect be? Will there be no deterrent? That's what we've seen. There is no deterrent. Because once they get away with it, there is no punishment. There is no even pushback in many instances. There is no punishment. And that's fascinating because if you look at the statutes of the United States, they make it clear that violations of civil rights by persons acting under color of law, and that you're talking about people in public office there, are serious crimes. Mm -hmm. In fact, if they cause death, if some public official acting under color of law violates someone's constitutional rights and, and the victim dies, the penalty, the highest penalty, could be death. So we're talking about something extremely serious, and yet everyone kind of shrugs themselves and says, well, there's nothing we can do about this. And it, uh, the Cuomo situation comes to mind. Mario, he's had all of these uh, uh, you know, sexual harassment charges made and Charges, okay, he hasn't been convicted of anything. But in order to avoid some problems connected with that, he resigns, or he goes off, maybe rides off into the into the twilight. Or maybe he'll come back in three or four years. Uh, we don't know. But the interesting thing about him is, what was probably the worst thing that he has done in the last couple of years? It wasn't sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. It was the nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he's not the only one. I mean, they had nursing home scandals in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Michigan, maybe other places, right, where the governors went along with or prodded the, who knows, the, the public health officials to cause the nursing homes uh, to take in the COVID people. And then, of course, the residents of the nursing homes were swept by a real epidemic. And obviously, on the face of that, that was nonsensical because those people in the nursing homes were the most susceptible, most vulnerable. even to normal flu. Yep. Right? So you look at this and say, well, why was that never investigated? Why was nobody civilly or perhaps criminally, if they knew what they were doing, they, you know, reckless endangerment? Endangerment, yep. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 criminal law is not only did I intend to do this knowingly, maliciously, but did I act in you know, extremely negligent fashion, grossly negligent fashion, you know, willful, what they call willful blindness, reckless indifference to the truth? Mm -hmm. right? If I had opened the book, if I had turned the page, I would have seen what the consequence would be, but recklessly I refused to do that. And I went ahead, all right? So there are different levels here. Uh, but no one's looking into that. And I thought to myself, what could be more important? whether Cuomo sexually harassed or didn't harass or you know, was just being an Italian with some number of women, or whether he engaged in a policy with recklessness that caused the deaths of 15,000, 16, whatever the number was, thousands of people, needlessly, which is more important? And the short answer is, although you see some commentators on the air when he resigns saying, well, you know, what about the nursing homes? That wasn't that worse. Nothing is being done. Department of Justice said, oh, we're not even going to investigate this. We got some paperwork from the New York authorities, and that's enough. 
That's not the way criminal cases are normally investigated. You don't normally say, well, we'll have the suspect give us some paperwork and then we'll just drop the investigation. Well, so there you go. I mean, there's another example. That's, kind of, that's another kind of microcosmic, a little, maybe a little larger than the Trump example. But there's another, another microcosmic example of where we are. That here was a really horrendous set of events. And no one apparently wants to really dig into them to see who was responsible. And whether they were responsible as a result of just ignorance or accident or reckless endangerment. What was it? Do we want that kind of thing to happen again? And if we don't know what happened and who was responsible and what the degree of culpability was, aren't we inviting it to happen again? Right, as we've seen in other cases. Dr. Vera, I noticed that we are uh, running out of time, and I still wanted us to be able to get to some things that you've touched up against. Uh, We won't have time in this interview. I'll have to circle back with you real soon, uh, because along the way you talked about uh, things that should have happened that didn't happen. Another one that I wanted to get into in the future with you is about the journalistic and media silence and complicity through much of this, scientific complicity. Uh, and then you mentioned deterrence. How do we get to justice? What are the remedies? And in the past, you've talked about if within the system, the system has been so so compromised that you can't resolve the problems within the system itself, if it's been uh, compromised by the deep state or whoever you want to call it, then what is the higher level of law and how do we get to personal options that individuals can take action right now in their own lives uh, for the good of themselves and their family? We're going to have to regroup with you very soon on those and just very grateful for your thorough uh, walking us through this today and um, and uh, give you another minute if you'd like to, to, to bring us to a sense of closure of at least this ex- exposition that you've done and, and, uh, and how people can uh, find you online if they'd like to read your other works. Well, you can go to News With Views, one word, newswithviews.com, and I have a, an archive there. Articles come up and then an archive. And I have uh, quite a few books available on, at Amazon. Uh, look up my name and you'll, you'll get a list of those. And then there are quite a few um, YouTube presentations that people have done. I've given talks on one subject or another. Uh, a lot of talks dealing with money in the Federal Reserve. People right. who are particularly interested in that. Uh, and you can dig those out. Uh, and a number of others dealing with the this kind of general constitutional questions we're talking about right now, which is what people have to think about. You want the final word is, this is in the mind of the beholder in a sense. Right. Your constitutional system is something that you have to understand before you can hope that it's going to be enforced. And I think that's something that people now, because of the educational system is so corrupted, right. people have to do on their own. We'll talk next time that we get together, and it'll be much sooner, I hope, than, than this one was from our last visit with you, about what those things are that people can and must do on their own, what, what options we still have left to us in this dystopic uh, not a dystopic future, it's a dystopic present that we're living within, and um, what we can what we can do about it as individuals. So we're just very grateful, as always, for your presence here with us, Dr. Vieira. We've been speaking with Dr. Edwin Vieira, constitutional attorney here on Liberty and Finance. And uh, Dr. Vieira, just thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Welcome back.